Thank you. We're up to our, uh, Julio Guerrero of Draper Lab. Julio. Good morning. Uh, before I start, I want to thank you very much, uh, Saudi Aramco, for organizing this event. Uh, everybody with whom I have conversed in the past two days uh, agree that this is coming up as an excellent event. Um, we hope you repeat this. Thank you very much also for the opportunity you are giving me to share a few thoughts with you. I also want to thank you in particular uh, the engineers at Saudi Aramco with whom I have uh, interacted in order to, to put this together. Uh, particular emphasis on the engineer with whom I interacted like um, uh, Amaro Bustamante, Joe Thorpe, thank you very much. Um, I will share with you a few uh, experiences collected in the past uh, 10 and 15 years uh, implementing research collaborations uh, between uh, corporations, academia, and research centers. So, this painting was produced by um, Rafael Sancio in 1509, almost 500 years ago. Uh, why am I bringing this painting to your attention? Because to me, this event that we are having right now is very similar in many ways to what they were doing 500 years ago when the Renaissance was starting. You can see in the center of this painting, you can see Aristotle and Plato, who are actually played by Leonardo da Vinci and some of the people who live at the same time that Rafael Sancio did. You can also see there Pythagoras, Euclides. You can also see one of the uh, key philosophers of the Arab world. I think the way you pronounce his name is Averroes, who is on the far left of the painting. Uh, the Western civilization in the Renaissance, they were starting to uh, get out of the dark ages and they look at what had been done before, not only in the Greek civilization, but also in the Arab world. What else can I see in this painting? The sense of collaboration. In the School of Athens, you can see uh, many characters who represent all the sciences that until that time had been produced. And what happened when they started to collaborate? They started to get out of the Dark Ages. 500 years later, we are, in my opinion, getting into an analogous situation. In the last 50 years, uh, we have been uh, rediscovering uh, the value of multidisciplinary collaboration. And my presentation will emphasize that. When you are an engineer in a typical uh, engineering project in most of the oil and gas corporations, there are five factors that you have to deal with. One of them is time. Let's make a, uh, a case here. Let's say an engineer uh, is being given 12 months to produce something, let's say a a crawling robotic system to convey logging equipment in a horizontal well. So he will be given a fixed amount of time, 12 months. He will be given engineering requirements that will most probably will be brought to his table by the product champion, somebody who has been interacted with the field engineers. The third constraint will be the budget. Let's say for discussion purposes that he's be given $2 million to produce this. Uh, chances are that if he starts in January, before December, he will not receive more than $2 million, but he will be actually asked to do it with less budget. The fourth is the people. Let's say that he's being given a team of 10 engineers. And the fourth, which is the topic about which my presentation will go around, is the knowledge. The amount of knowledge that a manager of this team will have 
is limited to what his engineers have. Of course, if it's a large corporation, probably he will have access to a very large uh, data uh, uh, database and probably a network of knowledge inside the corporation. But in general terms, due to the stress and the other uh, first four constraints, the knowledge is limited by what is in the brains of his uh, engineers. What does he have to do? By December, he has to produce a system that works. It doesn't have to be 100% perfect. Probably it's going to be 80% perfect, sometimes 70, because he's going to be judged by delivering tangibles. And that's what I would call the art, the artistic part of being an engineer. You can have a bunch of knowledge, but you have to balance all these five parameters in order to produce something tangible by the end of the project, by the time that he has been given. <clears throat> this is one of the many ways in which a um, project uh, life is structured. Usually, you start with the process in which you are funded. Uh, then you go into the conceptual phase. Then you go into the feasibility phase. The development itself that usually translates into producing uh, experimental prototype, then an engineering prototype that will be taken to the field for testing. And when they feel that it's mature enough, it will be passed from the product development team to the commercialization team. And then it will be obsolete, I don't know, five, six, seven years later. What are the projects that usually give the highest return on investment? In some companies are called the uh, NP5, the new products or new technologies that are, that are having technology that is uh, within one and five years uh, new. There are products that have technologies that are older than five years technology, but usually the ones that give the most return on investment are the MP5. We will focus on this part in the next slides. So, in this uh, plot that we have here, in the horizontal axis, we have the TRL, the techno technology readiness level. Uh, it varies depending on the industry usually goes from one to seven, eight. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm trying to map here the technology readiness level with a typical dissection of a project with a conceptual feasibility, engineering development, and commercialization. And in the vertical axis, you have the innovation or the speed at which the project is advancing. What I have experienced is uh, when corporations work alone, Usually, this is a pattern of the uh, innovation as you are moving across the TRL. Not always, but most of the time, they have um, incremental improvements, not necessarily uh, what I call intergalactic improvements. When you collaborate with universities, not always, but in many cases, with universities, you can uh, move the dial a little bit into the end of TRL2. Uh, usually universities are not in the business of crossing the valley of death or putting a product for commercialization. That's what it call the valley of death. So what does a project manager or vice president who is debating about investing on collaborations with research institutions or universities deals with? How can I get return on investment from this? Um, sometimes they fund more the project um, to take it further, but usually the uh, objectives of both institutions are not uh, connected that well, so usually this happens. So why am I putting the word new between quotation marks? because it is not new. 
as I was showing in the painting of the School of Athens, the concept of collaboration and the concept of having multidisciplinary teams is not new. We discovered that more than 500 years ago. And what happened when we discovered that a multidisciplinary approach could take us from the dark ages? We evolved at high speed during those oh, almost 100 years of the Renaissance. So when I'm looking at you, this may sound a little bit funny, but I am actually seeing the School of Athens in front of you because you guys have a multidisciplinary background. I have been talking with you during the last two days, and I have been fascinated about the variety of technical backgrounds that you have, the variety of interest. Um, in my personal experience, the projects that have produced the most innovation in all cases have been the ones that have members in the team with the largest variety of backgrounds. And I don't mean just cultural background, but also technical background, because even though at the beginning it's a little bit challenging to converge into something that is really good, it's a variety of backgrounds that want to bring the most innovation. So this is my painting. This is not Rafaelo. This is Julio Guerrero. This is my version of the School of Athens. So what do we have here? On the left of this uh, drawing, I call uh, divisions. This is a map of how we can work together in order to get more return on investment when we implement collaborations between corporations, academia, and research institutions. So on the left, under the part related to divisions, we have some control, subsea, world services, subsea. Those are projects in a portfolio that are related to, let's say, immediate uh, application of technology. On the right, I call it fundamental science. So I put three examples of a portfolio that has robotics, borrowing or biomimetics, and mechanisms in general. When you look at the top row in a uh, light green background, what you have there is a number of research projects that are being run at the academia level. But you will see in each one of those squares, you usually see a professor on the top uh, left corner, somebody from the corporation, and below we have uh, two uh, PhD students, master students, or researchers from academia. What is common across the first row is that there is a pattern. There is always somebody from the corporation co-researching with a professor and the students. In a few seconds, I will explain to you why that is very important in order to maximize the return on investment from the perspective of the corporation and also for the research organization. When you look at the second uh, row in a darker uh, blue background, uh, on purpose, I have removed the pictures of the actual people. Uh, you have on the top left corner, usually a vice president of each one of the divisions. On the right side, you will have a business development manager, the one who is given at the beginning of the fiscal year some amount of budget, and he's asked to produce innovation or new products, and his uh, bonus at the end of the year will be measured by how much his projects increment the uh, uh, overall uh, amount of money that the division has. And then below that, you have the engineers. It's very important to make a connection between the top row and the second one. What usually happens is that many uh, of the top managers in the company, they say, hey, John, I gave you um, I don't know, a quarter million dollars in January, and all you are bringing back in December is a report. And what do we do with the report? How do we cross the value of death? So one of the mechanisms that you may want to consider is to have not only a champion inside the company that is promoting this research, but also the same person is continuously interacting 
between the academia and the future stakeholders inside the corporation because it serves two purposes. The professors and the students in the university or the research centers will appreciate the application that the research will have. It doesn't mean that the corporation will shape the research that the professors are doing because they should not be doing that, but they will be giving application cases. So that inspires the students to perceive the value of what they are doing. They will continue doing their pure research. In order to get a PhD, you won't get a PhD by designing a nut or, a, or electric motor. You know, it has to be innovative research. But it allows them to connect the research with a practical application. And the people in the corporation also have a chance to input information into the uh, process of research. Um, and the bottom uh, row, you have some of the uh, results of this research. And the very uh, bottom one, you have some uh, uh, translation of the research into um, value for the corporation. Yeah. Um, another point that may be valuable for you to consider is that organizations like NASA, Woods Hole, National Labs have a lot of uh, cases in which they have crossed the value of death. And that's something for many corporations to consider when they are trying to invest into projects that will allow them to cross the value of death. So, 30 years from now, I hope you remember two things from this presentation. The five things that all engineers have to deal with in their project, and number two, that the new absolute in order to achieve the most return on investment is that it is a multidisciplinary world. Thank you very much.